Good evening, Drew. Hello, Paul. How are you? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> that, that good, huh? Oh, I mean, never better. How are you what's doing? Going, what's going on, buddy? You still boiling oh, just, water, or just no, no? It just it's it's been it's been a long week. Okay. Yeah, just I'm just, I'm 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 ready for bed, but uh, haven't been sleeping well. So yeah, yeah. Okay. How, 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 but you know, meh. Yeah, that's okay. all good. Well, I mean, you wanna you wanna talk about it? Nah. How are you doing? I wanna know how you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired too, buddy. It's been a been a long week for me too. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I was uh, I was feeling a little misty eyed this week. Well, uh, okay. <laughs> Paul, you, you know me pretty well. I think um, I do. I, I would. Yeah. I think so. I think so. Yeah, you think so. I I would agree with that. I uh, I had to be mean this week, and I feel kind of oh, bad about it. Oh, no. Yeah. What happened? Yeah, contrary to popular belief, sometimes I do feel remorse for the things that I say. Um, <laughs> I I had to be mean to the to the lawn care people. Uh-oh. What happened? Okay, look, 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 look. We just we need to get this out of the way. <laughs> it is extra special times in America right now, and <laughs> me complaining mm-hmm. about my lawn care does not matter it just it doesn't it doesn't matter it doesn't none of this matters none of this matters however okay here's here's what happened i there's just just no way there's no there's no good there's no way i look good here um uh so we have a uh we have a lawn care company that comes and takes care of our yard now i don't have a very big yard um you've been to my home yeah um, I, I would say that I have one of the bigger lots in my neighborhood because I have a corner lot and we have grass as one does. And, um, last year towards the end of summer and fall, it was very dry here. It was exceptionally dry. It didn't rain a lot. A lot of people's lawns suffered. And, you know, listen, outside is where things that I like are not. So I don't like yeah. being outside. Okay. Avid, yeah, avid is- endorsement. Same. Right. Yeah, avid endorsement. So to say that I don't necessarily take great care of my lawn, it's pretty accurate. I mean, I have a company that comes out and does, you know, they spray for the weeds on the lawn, and they cut the grass, and they mulch, and they do everything. They also do snow removal, right? So that is a service that is a luxury that I afford, okay? If you're like me, you probably do just enough lawn maintenance not to get yelled at by your neighbors. And and that's fair, right? <laughs> Like I don't, I don't own, I don't own a lawnmower. Okay, and that's okay. that's a pretty good place for this story to start. Is that I don't own a lawnmower, but I'm close, and and here's why. So this company that does the landscaping, they come out and they have those fancy lawnmowers that like they have like the things that can turn like yeah. on a on a dime. You know what I'm talking about? The zero thing. turns. Yeah. yeah, zero turns, grasshoppers, whatever they're called. Right? Yeah. They have those and. They, they, you know, they're out there rambling across my yard every Thursday uh, with their lawnmowers. And a couple weeks ago, um, I was noticing that my yard has recovered somewhat from last year because we've been getting a lot of rain and some sun. And I have some really exceptional, exceptionally shady parts of my yard. So it doesn't necessarily, it's not conducive to growing things to begin with. Okay. And I have some really like bald spots in my yard where either there's like trees that are shading it or there's like gutter runoff if I'm not good at keeping up with my gutters. And I'm trying to correct that. Well, I was out there the other day and um, this was a couple weeks ago. And it's it's sort of boiled over because this has been ongoing for a while. But uh, I was trying to plant some grass seed. Okay. And I was, like, sizing up my yard, and I was figuring out, like, how much grass seed I'm going to need. And I was walking out there on a Friday. Now, they uh, they cut the they cut the grass, weather permitting, every Thursday in the summer. And this was a Friday, so this was the day after they cut the grass. And I'm walking through my yard, and I'm like, it doesn't look like they cut my, like they, they cut my grass. Like, it just it didn't look like it was cut, especially, like, around the edges of my yard, like, near the curb, near the street. Um, near some of, like, the mulch beds. Like, it just didn't look like they edged. And I started walking around the house, and I, like, walked over towards where, like, my neighbor lives, and it certainly didn't look like they ran the lawnmower, like, through a particular strip of his grass. So 
it just smacked of laziness, right? And I'm like, all right, maybe they ran out of time. I can go a week. You know, I can deal with this for a week. Okay. Um, very, very healthy, mature. Very uh, healthy, yeah. mature, new Drew attitude, okay. right? right? I didn't yeah. fly off the handle, as as people have claimed that I do. So I I waited a week, and they came out the following Thursday. They rumbled across my yard with their lawnmower <laughs> again, um, and I, I took a walk outside uh, because we. Had, <laughs> Side side note, um, my front yard is like seventy percent grass, thirty percent ant hill right now. So, oh, total, okay. To, okay, totally different story. I, oh, oh boy, I have big ant hills in my yard, but that's that's a whole other that's a whole other podcast episode. Uh, okay, okay. That was while I was I was walking around out there, and uh, you know the places that they didn't mow last time. Uh, looks like they ran the lawnmower across, but still not a uh, a, a great job. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I was um, outside, and uh, they were doing a walkthrough of the neighborhood. Now, obviously, if you own a home, you are more than likely subject to the the, the tyranny of the homeowners association. <laughs> um, so yeah. this isn't mm-hmm. this is something that I think most of our listeners may be may be familiar with. And they, you know, they enforce the rules, right? Like, you want to paint your front door orange? Ha <laughs> ha! Not on my watch. Like, there's gonna be there's gonna be some people who. Uh, who don't like that. And there's certain rules that you have to adhere to in the neighborhood, like making sure that your garage door and your siding is, you know, kind of relatively matched. And, you know, you're keeping up with the appearance of your home, keeping everybody's properties values high. I mean, really, this is what this is all about, right? Is my property yeah. values. Okay. So they were out doing a walk through the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, I joked with them like, ha ha, I don't think I have anything wrong with my house this time. And they gave me a nervous laugh, and I didn't know if that was good or bad. And I said, oh, hey, by the way, uh, noticing that my front yard isn't necessarily getting cut so good. And one of the ladies that was doing the walkthrough said, huh, now that you mention it, my yard hasn't been looking super great either. So that sort of touched off a a series of events, (laughs) in which case I had a a – fast forward to yesterday, I had a – a spirited conversation with our community management company mm-hmm. about how it just my grass doesn't look like it's getting cut. So am I – and it culminated with me saying, so should I just take my home ownership dues and apply that to a new lawnmower? Well, that gentleman didn't like that <laughs> statement at all because uh, I feel like I'm going to have to start cutting my own grass at this point. And I just – I had to be mean. I had to mm-hmm. be mean. And it's not – I don't know who's really at fault here. I feel like – this is one of those situations where I don't know if lawn care is an essential business. I'm sure that he's probably the the guy that runs the landscaping business is probably or landscaping business is probably working a little short staffed, and I need to be cognizant of that. But I don't know. I feel like things are somewhat back to normal, and oh, that's good. Yeah, I mean they're 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 running the lawnmower over my, over my yard. They did it today until it started raining. So my grass is half cut because of the rain. So I, you know, okay. I, that's like act of God. I can't get upset about that, but yeah. man, I'm a, saying that out loud makes me sound like such a terrible person. Um, no, anyway, so, it, it, sometimes you gotta get it off your chest. Yeah. It feels good. It feels good to heal. This is the, this is a place of healing. This is a place of healing. I still got to figure out how I'm going to plant some grass seed in my yard. You know, we ended up, uh, farming that out last fall uh, to uh, the company that does our lawn. And they recommended that not only did we put down seed, we put down uh, some topsoil on mm-hmm. top to kind of fill in the patchy spot. And let me tell you, the, 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 the we did that because like when we moved into the house, uh, they only put sod down so much in the back of the house that kind of goes into our little, you know, decorative retention pond. They just put grass seed on it. And it, it, it's tough, right? Grass seed is either going to go really well or it's going to look like crap. And this particular case, it was very patchy. So they put down some topsoil and a bunch of seed. And, man, it looks great. So yeah. we're actually thinking about doing that for the whole yard uh, coming up here as well. Just, to, yeah, it was it looks really good. Well, my lawn looks a lot like my hair did to where like you can sort of see the scalp, but there's still some <laughs> there's still some like grass on it. So like there's just it's just really thin and I just need to get in there with like some turf builder or something. And like I don't really know what like the the right time of year to do this is 
Like, I'm told that you're supposed to do this in the fall, but I don't know. Like, it's yeah. not summer yet. Like, I feel like I can get out there and throw something down there and have some grass grow. Like, how hard is it to grow grass? It's technically a weed. Like, I throw yeah. down seed, add water, uh, question mark, profit. Like, I don't know. I don't know what more I'm missing there. So yeah, we, if you're... We've always done it late summer, early fall. And that's what exactly what the what Google says, late summer, early fall. So, mm. so I got to deal with yeah. this with this crappy yard for another, I don't know, five months. Yeah, great. Uh, not not the end of the world. It it is not the end of the world. That that, 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 could, that could probably be the title of our podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's not the end of the world. I, I'm sure. I'm sure it's not the end. Uh, of their worlds okay yeah that's good there go that's a good one uh, anyway okay uh your turn what kind of grievances do you got this week uh you know what <sighs> I, I think one of the reoccurring themes that we've been going we, we've had since this whole covid19 you know thing going on and you know now america's like literally on fire uh <laughs> It's it's these little grievances, like these little griefs that we go through. And uh, this last couple of weeks, I've been really missing live music. Just mm, like deep down into the into the the core that is Paul. I, I miss I miss concerts. I like I like cr- being crammed into a place. You know, asses to elbows. Well, I said a swear. Uh, that's okay. Nice job. Proud of you. <laughs> might be might be your first one. Uh. uh Second, second. Uh, okay. uh, you know, loud music, bright lights, you know, everyone having a good time. <sighs> it just it just makes me sad. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and I've been trying to fill the gap. Like, some of the bands that I like are releasing, you know, uh, previous concerts that they had recorded or, you know, trying to keep engagement with the fans high since they can't tour but i mean it's just not it's not the same you know watching a video on youtube is not the same as you know that feeling you get at a you know at a live show Mm -hmm. Uh, i I really don't have much more than that i just yeah well as i understand it that's a pretty big outlet for you for a number a number of things that help you be yeah right yeah i mean music's very important to me uh you know, it's a big part of who I am and and my identity. Heck, I'm wearing a, I'm wearing a band T-shirt right now. Uh, mm, shocker. Yeah, I mean, like I say, if I don't wear metal T-shirts, how do people know that their taste of music is worse than mine? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a pretty valid point. Yeah, I mean, that, uh, that's uh, like, oh, well, he's a metalhead. I mean, oof. <laughs> well, all right. Well, let's well let's let's unpack uh, this a little bit. So I saw that there was an announcement today. So today is okay. June fourth. Yep. Uh, I saw an I saw an email come across my personal inbox because I'm mm-hmm. tied into a, a lot of weird mailing groups, and I confirmed this on a local news TV website that it looks like June 10th is the next big like opening milestone here in Ohio. Like places yeah. like zoos are going to open again, which mm-hmm. I always kind of view concerts as just human zoos. So. Have they given you any indication about when you're going to be able to go see some music yet? Every major venue that I've seen and like the stuff, because, you know, I'm a metalhead. I I follow, you know, metal websites and news and stuff on Twitter. Uh, Everything I've read is basically concert promoters have have just written off uh, this year completely. Uh, There will be like no... Like even though things starting to get lifted, uh, it's unless you really limit the number of people in a venue, you really can't do it safely, and then it's not really viable, you know, economically to really do it. And especially the music I listen to, so much of it is you know that sea of people that re- you know like <laughs> mosh pits, right? You can't have a live show with a you know a mosh pit safely uh right now and probably not for quite some time you know even though you know like the economy is opening back up and people are getting back at it but i mean really still should be social distancing and wearing masks and i mean a social distant metal show would be uh it's that's not that's not the point of the music right like i feel like a i feel like a social distance metal concert is (laughs) 
like what I imagine a Kenny G concert to be like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you you pretty much nailed it, right? It's you know, well, that, plus, that you know, sea plus, of people that yeah. Yeah. And like the whole idea of a social distancing concert is counterintuitive to a metal concert because how are you supposed to beat people up? Well, it's mosh pits are not about beating people up. It's it's a it's a form of it's a form of expression and maybe maybe you know, bordering on on dancing. Uh, you know, I mean, that's where it came out of was like the slam dance stuff and the, and the mm. you know the punk scene. Uh, but it's that vibe, you know. It's that you know every, that catharsis of getting it out of your system and just that raw animal energy, uh, which you know. So kind of like me and masturbation, then. Th- yeah, there you go. Okay, all right. Yeah, and also, like you know, I've got you know a pretty good group of friends that go to concerts with and i mean i haven't seen them since you know well gestures at all of this uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's that's funny yeah smells nice jerry's probably really anxious to get to a concert with you yeah yeah and like jerry with and the this, g jerry with the g and this i mean I, I i'll bring it up again like this spring and summer like we had just an awesome lineup of shows to go to and just one by one they're being postponed and i'm I'm hoping next year you know we'll get to do the same thing again and everything back to normal and i'll be fully vaccinated and not have to worry about this crap anymore and you know we won't be riding in the streets and (laughs) well it's just asking a lot so uh do you um do you feel Mm-hmm. Uh, wait, no, that's not the right way to ask this. Do you think uh, you could get – have any of the bands – man, I'm going to really formulate a thought here. Are any of the bands that you're currently following doing the online concert thing? Uh, a few of them are. Uh, recently uh, – it was like a couple of days ago, and I, I still have to work my way through all of it. There was uh, – who put it together? Hold on. I'm going to do – give me a second to do some research. Ah, that's playing. Okay, so the website Metal Injection put together a Slay at Home Fest. And uh, the gimmick of that was is they got a bunch of uh, metal bands, like not huge names, but not small names either, right? Uh, I mean, if, if you're not in the scene, you wouldn't have – you know, you wouldn't recognize any of these names. But the gimmick was is these bands would play a couple of songs and all of the art, you know, all the bands were basically playing from home, right? So they each recorded their own pieces and they kind of mixed it together. Uh, and that was nice. Uh, you know, I, I've still got some stuff to go through and, uh, you know, s- watch some more of that. Uh, there's been one band. Uh, it's I, I, <laughs> I mentioned them uh in a previous show, when the new album came out, uh, Code Orange, uh, they've been really active on the online kind of uh, scene. Uh, they've done a live, a, a live empty venue show. I think they were like one of the first bands to really do it. Uh, and then they've been doing kind of like an every other week, every three weeks kind of like web series on Twitch, where they would basically like, uh, like. They would do like an interview or, you know, they have uh, like, you know, like a DJ and he would make like one of the things was him just mixing music for an hour. Uh, they had one where one of their guitarists really kind of broke down the tracks. Uh, the recent one is they pulled back an old uh, an old show from a, a festival in Pittsburgh and they played that and then they did some like retrospectives on that show. Uh, I mean, so there's been like new content out there, right? And, and I've been absorbing it. You know, I've I've got a little, you know, I've jeez, oh, a lot. Uh, anytime I find like a good concert on YouTube, I download it and throw it on my Plex, right, just to have it forever. Uh, How do you do that from YouTube? Uh, there's huh, huh, there's uh, a wonderful okay. command line app called YouTube uh, DL. I will put a link in the show notes. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether it runs on Windows. Uh, no, it runs on Unix, Windows, and Mac OS. Uh, ah. it's, just, it's just a it's a command line app. Uh, I have installed it via Homebrew. You just run that, and it supports more sites than YouTube. Uh, a, a lot of sites, but originally it was YouTube. Oh, and, some oh, dude, the, some, mm. some some sites some sites we really shouldn't mention on a family podcast. Uh, exactly. Those kind of sites. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh yeah, there's a lot a lot of those. Uh, but 
it's really good. It's really fast. Uh, under the covers, it uses uh, like one thing I like about it is you can essentially how I usually run it is I run it and I basically say, "Hey, pull down the best video stream, pull down the best audio stream," and under the cover, it uses uh, FF, FFmpeg to kind of combine those two tracks together. And uh, I am really, uh, yeah, I hey, like it quite a bit. You know- Speaking of that utility, like the whole FFmpeg command line tool, pretty powerful. Like oh, when yeah. we when we published the uh, Hasp videos, I needed to add a watermark. Did it with that tool. Surprisingly yeah. easy. Surprisingly yeah. easy. Yeah. Good so, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Let's. Uh, we we need to drop some. Uh, we need to drop some some links in in our in our show chat. Yeah. I, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Uh, you know, let's uh, let's keep the Paul train rolling here. So I, I see some uh, some more movement on the uh, Paul Dream Home uh, yeah. preparing for your birthday celebration thing here. I, I, so uh, let's uh, what do you what you get here? You got a sofa? I ordered, huh? I ordered a sofa. Uh, it's 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 fine. It's fine. Uh, so I I was basically given the instruction of it's my responsibility to pick the sofa, but it has to be gray. So oh. that was that was the requirement my wife gave me, and then I added kind of a second requirement of uh, I obviously you know we're very much deep into the quarantine lifestyle right like we don't leave the house much we're being very cautious, and I didn't want the uh, I don't want people in my house or people who felt like they belonged in my house to bring a sofa in. Uh, <laughs> I, it, just, uh, it, it made me feel really uncomfortable, and then like I was looking at some other sofas, and I'm like, like even if I have them drop this on like in my garage, then my wife and I have to deal about carrying it up the stairs, and like we could do it, but eh. so you know what? I just decided, hey, let's see what IKEA has, because mm-hmm. I know that an IKEA couch will come in a bunch of boxes, and I'll put it together. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I found one that didn't I didn't hate. Uh, there's a link in the show notes. It's the Carl St- Carlstad sofa. Mm-hmm. Uh, but let me tell you, man, IKEA's website is just bad. It's just it's just bad. Really? Uh, yeah. Like so. Just I've, I don't I've, know, man. I I sort of I sort of dig their website. Okay. Okay. So it it looks nice. But have you ever tried to purchase anything through it? <laughs> I've done like yeah. store pickup through there. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's a the the biggest grieves I had was uh you know so I added it to the cart and I went through the checkout process and uh, like I don't even think IKEA's are even open yet right so the only way to really do it is is to do delivery. Uh so you know you do your stuff and you proceed to check out. And the first thing, it's like, okay, here, uh, put in your zip code to see available delivery options. Like, oh, that's great. I'll put in my zip code. And, uh, you know, you know I'll, I'll do it right now. And I kind of walk through this wonderful shit show. Uh, again, that's, that's, that's twice in one episode. Man. Uh, so, you got to leave them in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I put in my zip code, right? So it knows where I live. So... Obviously, what it would do is default the you know the collected store drops that drop down list to the IKEA in Texas, Houston, Texas, because that makes the most sense. Uh, and it's not like this drop down list is in alphabetical order. It seems to be an arbitrary order because <laughs> there's other Texas like you know IKEA is about a third of the way down. It's just an arbitrary order of all of the IKEAs in all the United States. And then you have to pick one. So I'd pick, you know, the Ohio one. And then it was like, oh, hey, uh, by the way, uh, after you made the selection, it'd be like, oh, yeah, we don't have any delivery windows. Uh, (laughs) Please try again later. Well, okay, so hold on a second. Using the uh, phenomenal Microsoft Edge browser, uh, Mm -hmm. I go to the IKEA website, find Mm -hmm. an IKEA location near me. There's a handy Mm -hmm. drop down that Mm -hmm. appears to be organized by state. Yeah, yeah, but but mm, make yeah. make my store. I don't know, yeah, Paul. Yeah, uh, it, it, mm. it, it it doesn't work in the checkout process. It does not work. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Fall but, bug. But but it's fine. It took me uh, a couple of days to actually go through the process and get a delivery 
window. So it's coming on Sunday. Uh, it was actually kind of funny because like I could have gotten it. Uh, I could have gotten an earlier with a smaller delivery window, but it was times where like both myself and my wife had obligations. She's doing some online training. I'm working. So like, which just do Sunday. Sunday is a 12 hour delivery window. It could literally show up at 9 a.m. or 9 p.m. Who knows? We'll find out together. <laughs> hmm. But yeah. So looking at the so looking at the sofa that you ordered, it mm-hmm. bears a very striking resemblance to the IKEA sofa that I have in my basement. Yeah. Uh, so much so that it, I was looking at it here. <laughs> um. So uh, we're okay. So we're big IKEA people in our house. Okay. Um, you know, IKEA is yeah, one of those we have, places. We have quite a bit as well. Yeah. yeah. IKEA is one of those places where, yeah, if you walk in there and buy a twenty dollars chair, it's going to fall apart. But mm. if you buy some of their nicer stuff, it's pretty durable. It's it's pretty nice. It's pretty. I like the modern kind of touch of most of the stuff that they have. So the sofa you're looking at here is very similar to the sofa I have in my basement, except the sofa in my basement, like those those arm pieces. So mm-hmm. knowing what I know about IKEA, is you're going to get let's see one two. Three, four, five. You're gonna get six boxes. You're gonna okay, get six. Okay, <laughs> maybe seven. No, maybe you're gonna seven. get seven. You're gonna get. You're gonna get seven. Wait, one, two, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. You're gonna get seven boxes. You're seven gonna get. Boxes. Um, you're gonna get. Uh, you're gonna get a box for each pillow, right? Okay. <laughs> maybe not a box. Maybe maybe a bag. You're a gonna bag. get a bag. Okay. I'll, I'll count get a bag. A, yeah. You're gonna get a bag for each pillow, right? Okay. You're going to get a box that contains the sofa frame, mm-hmm. which is the part of the sofa you sit on and the thing you put your back on. You're also going to get pieces that bolt onto the sides. Okay. So the assembly for you is going to be pretty straightforward. You're going to basically put the sides on and then using the supplied Allen wrench or whatever they give you, I highly recommend a driver tool, you're going to you're going to put those sides on, screw the, screw the legs on, and call it a day. And then you have to go through the fun... So- so assemble it so it's sofa shaped and then screw it together. <laughs> right. Uh, and then you're going to go through the fun exercise of putting the cover on the pillows and Ooh. the sides. Okay. So the, the cover's already going to be on the sides and mm-hmm. the frame. You're going to have okay. to put it on the pillows. And brother, I'm here to tell you, that's not a lot of fun. Not not fun. Um, your your fingers are going to be pretty sore because what you're going to have to do is sort of like grip and rip. Like you're going to have to like really sink your fingers <laughs> into the cover and pull them over the pillow. Okay. So just just hmm. be ready for that. I recommend okay. drinking heavily. <laughs> I, I will note that. Yeah. So oh. we have two we have two IKEA sofas in the house. The the one I'm looking at here that you link to looks very similar to the one I have in my basement, except I have blue. And then upstairs I have a similar sofa that doesn't have legs. It just sort of oh. it it just, it just sort of is like it just sort of like sits on the floor. Okay. Um. Yeah, and we're happy with it. They're very comfortable. Um. Mm. You know. A sofa is one of those things that if you want to spend eight thousand dollars on a sofa, you probably can. Yeah, I've never been like a fancy sofa person. Like the main requirement of any sofa I buy is, can I lay on it in such a way that I can fall asleep and still see a television? And every sofa that I bought from IKEA has passed that test with the flying colors. Yeah, that was another requirement for me as well. Is it had to be big? Like I was looking at some other websites, and uh, there are a lot of like. They're, they're bigger than love seats, but they're not quite a full size sofa, and that seems to be a very popular size now. And you yeah. know, I'm a six foot dude, so like, well, I I, yeah, I, so, I needed something that's big enough for me to like. I want to be able to nap if I want to. Yeah. So this is this is technically a three person sofa, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, even though it has two cushions, it's yeah, a it's eighty sofa. inches, eighty and three fourths inch. So and yeah, so uh, you'll be able to yeah. lay on it. Yeah, I'm hope I'm yeah, so. Yeah, this would be my first. I mean, I have plenty of IKEA stuff, but it's mostly bookshelves and tables. Uh, my my the main piece of furniture that like my TV sits on, and we have some surrounding bookshelves and stuff around that is all from IKEA. Uh, I've been really happy with that stuff as well. This would be my like my first sofa from them, but uh, yeah, I, I'm hoping that it works well and. Uh, I'm also really digging the fact that I'll just tell the person to literally drop it on my driveway and then please leave. Uh, <laughs> nice. And uh, yeah, and then I'll have a sofa. So yeah, and oh. and IKEA sofas are like I, I, IKEA makes really good sofas. I'm just gonna okay. say that now. Like 
some of their like bookcases and entertainment furniture, like I, I'm kind of iffy on. But like, you have to watch my, the low end stuff. You have to, yeah, you have to splurge. Because that for stuff, the, yeah, mm-hmm. that stuff will disin- That's safe. That yeah. stuff will literally disintegrate. But like in my upstairs office now, like I've got the IKEA sofa. I have an IKEA like um, ca- a series of cabinets that I built and put like doors with glass on them and lights on them, and then like. I got the the stuff that like the the shelves that you bolt directly to the walls type of stuff for like where my TV yeah. is and that stuff is holding up pretty good. Like the yeah, shelves yeah. are if you get yeah. up close to the shelves you can be like eh, I should maybe should have yeah. built these out of real wood, but yeah, for yeah. for the most part it's it's they're fine. Yeah, it's I fine. dropped a well, I don't have the white. Yeah. I guess I do have the white stain. I dropped a link in the show notes. Like the biggest piece I have is the Hemnez TV storage combination and ours is pure white. But I dropped a link in there, and it basically like takes up one of our entire living room walls. It's a nice little table for the TV to sit on, then a bunch of mm-hmm. bookshelves, and little a little above the TV piece. Uh, and that sucker's really nice. It was a pain in the butt to put together, let me tell you. But uh, it's uh, yeah. So I've been happy huh. with a lot of the stuff that we've got. Yeah. So this is going to be delivered on Sunday. Sun- Sunday. Hmm. Oh. Cool. Just in time for your birthday. Uh, just in time. Cool. Oh, so let's switch back to the Drew train. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So um, oh, let's just dive in. So yeah, uh, I had I had a uh, I had a uh, a Facebook memory pop up okay. uh, this week that it is now officially been one year uh, that I have worked for Microsoft. Excellent. How are you feeling and about that? I've got some mixed emotions. Um, okay. I mean, first, first and foremost, um, you know, we it, it's funny because I joined. I want to be careful about how much I say here, but I joined Microsoft right at the period of time where like the fiscal year was just ending. Mm-hmm. So I have been at Microsoft now for an entire year. And I'm getting ready to go through, like, my first year-end review process. People were going through their year-end review stuff right after I started. So, like, we're getting into the time of year where, like, everybody's going to be doing their year-end review stuff. And we're going to be talking about, like, hey, how does your year? You know, here's how mm-hmm. you did. And here's your feedback. And, like, all all of that stuff that you as a middle manager probably have to deal with. But <laughs> To an extent, yes. Yeah. yeah. So... So we're getting ready to go through that process now. So I was already sort of in a nostalgic state of mind, uh, kind of reviewing some things with my boss on my last one-on-one. And, you know, it's it's been a, it was a challenging year. It was a challenging year because, you know, I was adapting to life at a giant corporation, right, mm-hmm. where, you know, uh, you're, you have to sort of sink or swim. Uh, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot, of different moving parts to my job and I'll I'll I'm here to tell you that the technology is the easiest friggin' part of my job. Like yeah. Oof, yeah, managing all of the like workload and kind of just bouncing from thing to thing and and helping people fix things or implement things is it's been really challenging. Um okay. I was told to expect that it was going to be a challenging first year and all of those people were not wrong. Um, But now, you know, as I gear up to end the year, we're going to be entering year two and all of the training wheels of year of year one are gone. Like there will be like saying like, oh, I'm new here isn't going to work anymore. So like (laughs) so it's going to have to be uh, like I'm going to have to really like come out the gate when we flip over to next physical and just rock it. And. I feel pretty confident in my ability to do that. There are things that I can control in my job and things that I cannot. And I'm going to have to sort of just stride into year two, um, just keeping the momentum going that I have from year one. Um, I like my job a lot. Uh, there's, there's very, there's very little about my job that I do not like. Um, I think that you can always find things about any job that you have that you do not like. Um, but absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
I am exceptionally blessed to be on what is considered by a lot of people to be like the highest performing team of all the teams that exist in the in the realm of place uh, like in the realm of the branch of the company that I work in. Um, so I have a ton of really experienced and just extremely intelligent people uh, to lean on. And if it's a if it's a technical question about maybe a piece of technology that I haven't touched as much, they're there. If it's a procedural type question or like, hey, what's the right way to approach this situation? They are absolutely there to help. And everybody is super collaborative and we hold each other accountable for stuff. Um, you know, one of the things I love most about Microsoft is, you know, they really encourage the whole growth mindset thing where, you know, you're encouraged to to try. You know, there's there's no penalty for trying as long as you learn if things don't go right. And I feel like a lot of a lot of places will tell you that that's the case. Um, but I either find that with a lot of places, especially smaller companies, that it's either way on one side of the spectrum or the other where like you are severely punished for messing up or you messed up. I'll pat you on the head and hope you learn. But if you don't, it's OK. We're not really going to punish you anyway. So like. It's a it's a really unique like mix of um, accountability, um, being being empowered to try and to spread your wings a little bit, and like mm-hmm. this this sort of leads itself into a a discussion that we got a, a question in the email that I see was on the list here, so uh-huh. I'm just going to kind of segue into that. And you know, a friend of the show Eugene asked, you know, hey Drew. What was your motivation from trying to pivot away from more of a traditional DBA type role into like machine learning or big data side of things? And that's a fair question because, you know, I think that if I had to sum up the things that I've worked the most on in my time in this role right now is, yeah, I've had to get involved in some SQL Server stuff. But after working with SQL Server for so many years, you can only like teach people how indexes work so many times (laughs) and like, right. And you know, fix permission issues and all the administrative things that come with that. And it's not that I look, I'm not, I'm not like poo pooing that work. That's important work and being integrated with developers and other DBAs and helping people get the most performance out of their SQL servers. Like that's noble work. Like it's it's hard. Like some of that stuff is a lot of systems are still built on top of relational databases and they need to perform. Turns (laughs) fricking out. And like that yeah. is that is extremely no- like first of all all work is noble let's just get that out of the way but like <laughs> okay. performance tuning SQL Server like if that's your thing like great but like I just got to a point where I didn't really want to do that anymore and when I came into this role I was pretty upfront about that like hey yeah I was a DBA and I did that for a while but I don't want to do that anymore. I want to work more with like different Azure technologies, it's still in like the data and AI space, mm-hmm. right? But I don't want to touch SQL Server if I don't have to, unless it's like helping people migrate data out of that and into other places. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So, and like I told my boss that, and he was like, that's exactly what I wanted to hear, right? Because, you know, there's a lot of people on the team that I work on that are also kind of died in the wool DBAs and do that work. So it was a chance for me to step outside of that. And, you know, in my time, in my role, I've helped people, you know, m- migrate to like Azure DevOps and set up automation and deployments and code repositories. I've helped people do what I call data engineering, right? And I know that that like data science is and DevOps is sort of a loaded term, right? But, yeah, you know, for me, the whole data engineering thing of moving massive amounts of data to one place and, uh, helping people like ingest data quickly, whether it's through streaming or ETL or writing Apache Spark to process huge data sets and store them in data lakes or, you know, throw data into queues or, or stuff like that. Like I've spent a lot of time helping customers with that. And that to me is super rewarding. There's a there's a huge desire for that type of work out there right now. Yeah, um, absolutely there is. So, and And like... You know, if if the question from Eugene is, well, why would you want to stop being a DBA? It's just like, I just feel like I have a lot more to offer than that. Um, you know, I, I have a bit of a development background. I like writing code from time to time. So being able to, you know, work with APIs for cognitive services or cut some Python code for Spark or, uh, 
you know, write PowerShell in, in support of automation. Like, those are things that I think set me apart from other people who might just regular be regular DBAs, right? So right. I, I have a, a pretty unique skill set in that regard. And, you know, I find myself gravitating away from, like, that traditional DBA work because that's just what I want to do. And that's one of the really big perks about working for a place like Microsoft. Like, if you want to do something, you can go work on it, right? Yeah. Now, sometimes you're going to have to do some things that maybe you don't necessarily want to work on, but that's called <laughs> being a good team player, right? Like, that's right. that's stepping up and meeting the need. And, and trust me, that attitude is so appreciated at a place like Microsoft. And it's it's really good because – they want you to be your best and they give you a ton of resources and they give you a ton of opportunities to learn kind of on the fly or on your own time. Um, yeah. So, so that's why I've sort of gone down that path. It's just, I think it's kind of an evolution of my skills and my career. Like it's an opportunity to, to do those things. And yeah, you know, like, from, from oh. go, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so like to me, like I look at this, like, I mean, I mean, I have I have DBAs that work work for me. Like I and I I love them. Like they do a very important job. Like they're very important. But to me, it feels like like moving into data engineering and data science is more. It's less of like a mechanic and more of a practical application, right? Like you know, you're more part of the you know the producing the end result, right? And it's also a big part of it, like for me, and I think, like, I mean, you're, I think you're very much wired like me when it comes to this kind of stuff. Not that I'm technical anymore. Uh, hashtag middle management. Uh, like, you're always want to be pushing yourself and learning something else. As, as when the moment that you're done learning, it's like, what's the point? Like, yeah. if you're not always exploring the next thing, or you know, and 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 like in my career, I've explored some technologies that ended up being dead ends. Uh, but even then, I, I've I've learned from them and can apply them and the mistakes I made there, going forward. And yeah, like I don't want to be doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. I always want to be pushing myself and, uh, you know, learning new stuff and improving. And like I think for you, like this data science, this data engineering stuff is just part of that. Yeah, and and that's just it. Like I'm when it comes to learning technical content or honing my technical skills, like I'm I'm very much like a shark in that I can't stop swimming. <laughs> like I don't there are people who have had pretty successful careers and all they've done is been SQL server for their entire lives and yeah. more power to them, right? Like I feel yeah. like if that's if that's all you ever want to do, you can absolutely carve out a 20, 30 year career doing that. Like I don't think SQL that's server true. is going anywhere. Nope. But but like for me, like the the biggest the biggest like problem for me is like I don't want to get bored, and you know I don't necessarily know where my career will ultimately end up. Like you know, being at a company as large as Microsoft, it could go a lot of different directions. It could go leadership, it could go technical leadership, it could go product management. Like there's a ton of different opportunities out there, and you know I. I'm equally excited for continuing to grow in the role that I have, but also keeping an eye towards the future. Because if there's one thing I've been really bad at in previous jobs that I've had, it's finding ways to advance. And, you know, I, I know that I, necess that I don't necessarily think that people leadership is something that I would enjoy. It's not that I would be bad at it. But, you know, I like staying technical. I like getting my hands dirty with this stuff and, and trying to find a career that lets you do that long term while also sort of gaining more responsibility and becoming a bigger part of the process I think is ultimately what I want to do. I have no idea what a career like that looks like uh in yeah. my you know in my current universe, but that's something that I'm I'm going to try to to do and you know that's the other thing is like you know they at least my leadership is very open to the fact of, you know, what do you want to do, right? And then they they go out of their way to help you achieve what you want to achieve. It's that's great. It, it's 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 an interesting corporate culture that, I mean, I had heard stories about it, but now that I'm here experiencing it, it's it's pretty remarkable. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's been 
it's been an interesting first year, and I'm really kind of curious to see where year two goes. Yeah. So uh, so we'll see. I'm I'm proud of you. I'm happy for you. Uh, I hope you keep kicking 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 butt, and uh, yeah, and, and I, more important, most importantly, I hope you keep enjoying what you're doing. Uh, you know, we don't we don't make it a secret that you know. I was I was your manager at your last job, briefly. But I was your manager briefly. when you when briefly. you left when you left for for this. And uh, I mean, I don't like. I mean, I mean, this opportunity sound like working with you and knowing what you were looking for and and what you weren't getting uh, at your previous employer. Like this job, like I, I could not. Have, I don't think I could have picked a better job for you. <laughs> <laughs> like knowing your personality well, and and well, you know your your desire to keep getting better and your desire to teach and help others learn like to me this the job self sounded like it was like made for you and I'm glad that you're hearing that you know it, it, that it's challenging but rewarding yeah and and you know that's the that's like the other half of this conversation right is that yeah I don't work with Paul anymore Right. And I don't work at a place that, you know, for for six years, I really, really liked working at. And I felt like I did some things there that I'm I'm still really proud of. Yeah. Um, You know, if I'm being honest, I still have a lot of hurt feelings about how things wound up there. Um, I still feel like there's some people there that really let me down. Uh, you're not one of them, by the way. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. But I I still feel like I had more to give. I wanted to give, but there were there were certain obstacles in my way that I think were, I mean, I guess my opinion, right? I don't want to get you in trouble, but it's, it's one of those things where like it it was equal parts political and equal parts personal, right? Because, you know, listen, I have a certain style, right? And take it or leave it. Like I, I sort of wear my heart on my sleeve when it comes to my work and I take a lot of pride in it. And I feel like when people don't give the same level of passion like that, that is something that rubs me the in- an incredibly wrong way, right? And just, yep. you know, watching so many other people kind of get promoted for reasons that I don't necessarily understand, understand <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where, you know, when I had the audacity after six years to say, well, what about me? <laughs> you know, well, sorry, Drew, there's really nothing there. And, you know, I, I you know, I think that, you know, you and I have some pretty vivid memories about how I thought about that. <laughs> yeah, um, no. But, and, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's hard, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I can say that, you know, the, the relationships that I had there, the relationships that I thought that I had there, it, it you, you learn who your friends are pretty quickly in, <laughs> in scenarios like that. And, um, you know, there are people that I thought would have been more supportive that weren't, and that still haunts me a little bit. Um, they're the people that don't check on how you're doing, right? Like yeah. you, you learn who that is pretty quick and you know, I, I think that there's, I, I think that I'm still pretty bent about it, honestly. Um, maybe that's not a healthy attitude to have about it, but you know, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I would have done anything necessarily differently. And, and I knew that when I, when I hit that wall, I knew that I had to go. Um, yeah. and I had, you know, being as involved in the different communities that I'm involved in and still involved in, um, there were there were a lot of different opportunities, and I had a lot of people step up for me um, that were able to line up a lot of different opportunities. And believe me, I had I had a lot yeah. to pick from. Um, yeah. Some of them didn't pan out, and I'm sort of glad that they didn't. And <laughs> some of them some of them did. And you know, this is this is where I wound up because I had yeah. people in my corner to say, "Hey, listen, there's this job. I think you'd be great for it. You know, apply. I'll help you through it." And you know, when I look back at the things that I was told as reasons why maybe those opportunities didn't exist for me, the biggest ammunition I have against that argument is, well, look how easy it was for people to step up for me, right? Like, that's that's the part that yeah. I can't necessarily reconcile in my brain sometimes. And, you know, I still am in touch with a lot of people that I used to work with there, right? Like you and some other mm-hmm. people, and, and I'm thankful for those friendships, and we've been able to maintain them, but... You know, sometimes it is hard to think back on on that time there because six years is a long time, and you've been there like a really long time, right? Uh, like, uh, like thirteen and a half years. 
Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you've been yeah. you've been there an exceptionally long time, and you've seen that place transform quite a bit. You've seen how yep. the culture and the landscape has changed, and yep. you know you're you're a very respected figure there. I have no doubt that if I had just gritted my teeth and maybe toughed it out, like maybe we could I could have stayed on and been a successful employee for you. But yeah, I really felt like it was time to go for a number of reasons, and not just because. Uh, you know, I needed yeah, something yeah. new. And, and and we had those conversations, right? And like I like I knew the situation that you, you were in and what I you know like when I took over as as the, the leader of that group, you know, what the situation was and and we had those conversations and stuff and like and I I yeah, like I mean I, I don't fault you for, you know, looking for something else and, and, and moving on. Like Given the situation, I feel like you made the right decision for Drew, and like you're right, like we we could still be working together now, and you know we could just you, you could have gritted your teeth and gotten through it, and maybe things would have gotten better for you, you know maybe not, but uh, I mean you you had spent so much time and energy, you know, being part of the community and you know being respected and you know blogging and doing conferences and you know and heck even doing some travel and. Uh, when you, when you made the decision to move on, I was really glad that was there for you and you took advantage of it to really, you know, get you the, the role that was right for you. So yeah, I'm, I'm like, I'm pleased as punch for you, man. Mm. Yeah. And you know, and I think that, you know, in light of how, you know, there's so many people out there that maybe have lost their jobs or have been furloughed or are laid yeah. off because of things yeah. like coronavirus, like, you know, I didn't wind up in a situation where that affected me, right? Yeah, yeah um, same, same. <laughs> um, yeah, so there, there, and I mean, who could who could predict that, right? Like, had I taken another role with another company, like, would I have oh, been affected you, you, yeah, by that? You don't right? know. Like, yeah, yeah. There's no way to plan for stuff like that, and mm. yeah, yeah, and you know. To your credit, Paul, you you went the bat for me. I know that I know that decisions were made above your pay grade about my career, right? And you you carry you carry the water, right? Yeah. I don't fault you for that. Yeah. And you know it is what it is. And but to say that I don't think about it and think about how hard I worked and and all the things we accomplished there, it's it's hard not to wax a little nostalgic about it. Yeah, I, yeah, it, it, it's it's tough, especially when you you what you were there six years. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's a long time, especially in this industry, and and yeah, you you spend a lot of time and effort to to you know to to build things and work on stuff and build relationships. I mean, heck, it's a lot of the stuff that you built and for us, like we're still using, uh, right? <laughs> like, uh, yeah, well, that's I mean, hard. I, I, I mean, I, like for me, like this is literally the longest I've ever worked anywhere like before this i was a you know a, a consultant right so i had i had very little attachment to, to anything it was go in do a project for six months to two years it ends you go somewhere else do a project for six months you know two years uh so like i never i like i never went through you what would what you went through because like i stopped doing that because i was traveling and i didn't want to do that anymore uh so yeah yeah, I don't. Yeah, and, and, and like, and, well, oh, yeah. One that like being someone who was technical for so long, uh, like, I still think this is this is something that like a lot of companies haven't figured out is how to reward technical people in their career without making them managers. Uh, and uh, I mean, hopefully, like, like, granted, like you would be a perfectly fine people leader manager whatever you want to call it but i don't think that's what you want to do at least not yet and hope i think the bigger the company the more room you have to do that kind of stuff like yeah and yeah plus, and like, that's plus a company that really is just focused like you're, you're not doing technology because it's the means to an end for something else you're doing technology because that's what you do <laughs> right right so and and like the other thing, the other thing that's hard too is occasionally I'll get things that like pop up on my various social media media feeds about like stuff that we did that had nothing to do with our jobs, right? Like yeah. game nights or the, the lunch games mm. or like the trivia, like the other stuff that I help pioneer and champion and do that stuff for. And yeah. I don't know. It's, 
yeah, like I said, it's 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 a lot of mixed emotions. I don't necessarily have regrets, but it's put put it this way: this time of year is especially sentimental for me for a lot of reasons. Yeah, like you can't do anything for six years and not have strong feelings about it. It's it's not how humans are wired. <laughs> no, totally, totally. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that's a thing. All that right, is a thing. Yeah, we did a thing. Yeah. All right, so uh, let's talk about um, where people can find us and stuff. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, as always, you can find us on the internet at doingtheirbest.com. You can be a cool kid like Bestie Eugene and send us some uh, topic ideas. You can reach us on Twitter at doingbestpod. And you can reach me at Paul Baylor. That's B-A-H-L-E-R. And where can we find you, Drew? Paul from the sofa. Uh, mm-hmm. You can reach me. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter at Pitferg, P I T T F U R G. Don't be shy. Um, haven't been streaming as much, um, just because I just I just haven't had time. Um, hoping to get back into that here pretty soon as well. So look for look for some of that stuff to come. Um, yeah. like I guess I've been playing. I, did I see some Mech Warrior at some point? You did. <laughs> you did the new Mech Warrior. Pretty good. Uh, yeah, pretty I wanted good. to watch so bad that bit. I was uh, I was busy at that particular time, but I do love me some big stompy robots. Mm-mm-mm. All right, so 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 real quick, real quick for planning here. Uh, uh-huh. Your birthday is the twenty second. You said it is. Yeah. All right. We need to. We're gonna. I'm gonna line some stuff up for 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 that day. Okay. For that for that podcast week. All right. Just uh, you, just you've been warned. Okay. I can't wait. Can't wait. <laughs> All right, everybody. Until next time. Toodles.